So an interesting aspect about um, basic income and um, how, how the state has evolved over the last uh, 50 years is that in a certain sense, the decades of neoliberalism in the, by the 80s and 90s uh, were generally seen as, as a period where you have austerity, cuts in social spending. Um, but the mystery is that when you look at the numbers, um, public spending didn't decrease in most countries. So I'm Daniel Zamora. I'm a professor of sociology at the University um, of Brussels. And I work essentially on, on economic history, inequality, poverty. Interestingly, over the last 20 years, I think, uh, basic income has really become kind of an um, important topic in the development community. So, of course, you have uh, the United, United Nations that has been promoting uh, basic income, but even more, um, let's say, conservative institutions like um, the World Bank or the IMF um, have been kind of interested in the idea and promoting over the last uh, 10 years, at least, um, cash transfers as a, as a tool for poverty alleviation. And so one might say that this is kind of a progress in a certain sense from the structural adjustment uh, policies of the 90s and the uh, market-driven reforms that were imposed in many countries in the global south. But at the same time, we have to understand that this focus on cash, which is what it makes basic income appealing, of course, um, is also part of a, kind of a broader uh, displacement of development economics. And one aspect in particular that I think has, has been quite important over the last um, 10 or 20 years it's like the divorce from questions of poverty uh, and the questions of industrialization. That was kind of a crucial question for um, most of the post-colonial leaders in the post-war period. So for them, it was pretty clear that poverty was not um, the problem per se. Um, the question was poverty was a symptom of a broader question, which was the, the question of uh, industrialization and the, and the relations between the North and the South, and the inequal relations between the North and the South, especially trade relations. Um, and so, of course, when you think about poverty in that uh, framework, the solution is not just cash transfer. It's about transforming the global division of labor. It's about a state-led um, industrial policy. And that was really at the core of their vision of, uh, of development. Um, so what is interesting here is, like, for them, poverty, uh, poverty alleviation was about transforming the economies in which the poor actually live, rather than allowing them to be part of the market, to be part of the economy. So it's not just about altering income distribution, uh, but to think or to contest uh, the way we share labor at the global scale uh, more generally. And so the, 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 the shift here, which I think it's kind of important to understand why basic income has become so popular, is a shift from, uh, let's say, the 50s and 60s, a developmental state that is really uh, up to direct investment, uh, to control prices, uh, to create uh, jobs in certain um, industries, from what we call in the book a transfer state. So a state that is less concerned about actually intervening in the economy, but just reshaping um, the, the distribution of income. So in a certain sense, there is a, a shift from a state that is concerned from rights of the citizens to a state that is more concerned about the spending power of consumers. So there's kind of an kind of important uh, transition here that, as you see, is not just different tools that we use to think about poverty, um, but it's really how we think uh, about poverty itself that has radically changed and where money takes a, a bigger part um, of the story. The, the meaning of development in, the, in, the, in that story has, has radically uh, changed. You, you, you immediately see how the, um, the policies of the 90s, so that was made by um, the World Bank and the IMF and countries like Mexico, uh, most of the country, a lot of countries in Latin America, certainly also in, in South Africa, um, were basic income or cash transfers, because they didn't implement basic income itself, but the, the rise of cash transfers wasn't um, an alternative to those policies, but it was a complement to it, because those policies actually created more inequality, created more poverty in most, most of those countries. And then the question that emerged immediately is, um, how can we um, mitigate those effects, reduce, in a certain sense, poverty, but without putting um, in jeopardy the market reforms? And keeping the whole market framework, uh, keeping the whole uh, privatization agenda, but at the same time guaranteeing to everyone a certain minimal standard of living. So what is, what is kind of a striking is that the, the rise of cash transfers wasn't, let's say, um, a contestation of the last decades of the 90s and, and all those uh, reforms, uh, market-driven reforms, but was a way to a certain sense 
uh, go hand did go hand with in, in hand with those reforms and created let's say a, a, a less a market with a human face, uh, but without really um, putting into question what are the causes of poverty. You can ask anyone, what is poverty? Well, everybody will, will respond, it's lacking of money. It's like an obvious answer, right? Um, but for, for a long time, this was, wasn't the obvious response. I mean, this is kind of a recent definition of poverty, um, one that is actually based on the income distribution, so your, your place within the income distribution. That's how we, we call it an inter-individual um, definition of inequality or poverty. Uh, the problem with that definition is that, in a certain sense, it abstracts poverty, so it becomes something that is not embedded within social relations, especially relations of power. So most of the say, thinkers of the early 20th century that thought about poverty. Uh, for many of them, it was clear that poverty was a question of power relations. So uh, it was the effect of the unequal relations of power relations within especially the labor market. So if you want to tackle poverty, it's not about giving money. It's about giving them more power. It's about transforming those relations. So by allowing uh, collective bargaining, by uh, creating unions, um, by actually reducing the grip of the market on people's lives, meaning that they actually don't need money to get healthcare, to get education, to get a lot of things. Um, so the rise of this, let's say, cash-centered definition of poverty, um, in a certain sense, um, shadows all those political questions about how we organize society, about uh, how we share power, how we define uh, our needs, how we define uh, the jobs we want to do. If you, if you think about it, you can immediately see how um, you can think about poverty, of course, by the side of money, but you can also think, think about the other side, meaning reducing the dependence of, on markets. So, of course, if you say tomorrow there is rent control, it will have an effect on poverty. Um, if tomorrow healthcare is free, it will have an effect on poverty because, of course, people don't need money to then get those services. Um, and I think that we, over the last 40 years, we've really shifted from one uh, vision of it, which was increasing the rights that people have and then increasing the service they receive and then increasing the market and the dependence we have on the market. We shifted for another vision where uh, we allowed privatization of most public services, uh, we allowed uh, deregulation of the labor market, but at the same time we actually improved the access of cash to a certain amount of people. So we improve in a certain sense, the fiscal apparatus of the state while it retreated on other aspects, that especially uh, on public services. And this is a thing, is one of the, the, the questions that we should um, contest uh, if we want to think uh, about, about poverty today. And getting away from this kind of a very narrow understanding of poverty um, centered on cash and centered on money. The idea is that um, and the problem, especially uh, one of famous economists of the 20th century called Milton Friedman, so one of Chicago economists, one of the is probably most important uh, neoliberal economists, um, he was actually concerned about uh, in the 30s when he was actually working within the federal state in the US, he was actually concerned about um, the rising inequality and poverty, uh, which might be surprising for a neoliberal economist, but it, it was definitely a problem for them. It's like, okay, um, if we have a free market, it generates huge um, um, inequalities, and what is re our response to that? Um, and this is the reason why he came up with a version of basic income, one of the earliest versions of basic income, which was if you want uh, to provide to people a minimum set of, of, uh, of resources um, while keeping the market, uh, with keeping what I said, the price mechanism that allows um, um, society to be organized through uh, decentralized investments, um, then what we need is to create a system where people, if they fall under a certain um, threshold, they will receive money from the state, would be a, a basic income. Um, so the idea is, of course, that you can do welfare, you can do provide people a certain level of, um, of income, but without altering uh, the market mechanism. Uh, so that was his first concern. Of course, it was a huge criticism of, of uh, the Roosevelt uh, policies um, and the New Deal, and it's kind of an alternative to uh, the welfare state. So in, instead of having public health care, public education, public um, uh, services, then you can just get some money and you go on the market and you do the choices you want to do uh, for yourself. So it's a very different vision about how we think about needs. And I think this is kind of an important question, is how, 
how uh, we, we think about needs um, and how the way we think about needs has changed, changed over the last um, 50 years at least. Um, because the market is not something that um, reveals needs that are, are already there. Or uh, economists like to say that they reveal preferences. Um, the market are they constitute needs. And there is kind of a famous uh, quote from um, Steve Jobs who said that nobody knew um, he, he wanted an iPhone before seeing an iPhone. So of course he actually does produce needs that weren't already there. So we rely definitely more on the market to constitute the needs we, we have as a society and less on collective decision making, which was what Friedman didn't like. Um, the fact that rather than letting private investors decide what we need, we can put some of those resources uh, in common and decide together what we need. And that, of course, the outcome is very different because um, the, the decision is a democratic one rather than one made by consumers. And this is, I think, one of the big shifts that happened uh, during that period. And it also makes basic income a more appealing solution for welfare. Um, because it doesn't require for us to uh, argue or to discuss democratically about our needs, but just for um, consumers to go on the market and make uh, their decisions as they see fit. So an interesting aspect about um, basic income and um, how, how the state has evolved over the last uh, 50 years um, is that in a certain sense, um, the, the, the decades of neoliberalism in the, by the 80s and 90s uh, were generally seen as, as a period where you have austerity, um, c cuts in social spending. Um, but the mystery is that when you look at the numbers, um, public spending didn't decrease in most countries, um, neither in the United States, where it actually increased, neither in Europe. Uh, but what really changed, and this is kind of a significant change, is the way um, the state spend its money. Um, so while, let's say, in the 50s, the state will I don't know, pay for um, health care, pay for uh, public servants, uh, and actually directly employ a lot of people, um, or build, for example, social public housing. Uh, the transition we had uh, in that period it was not in reducing spending, but was rather than building housing. We will give you some cash to help you with your rent, uh, meaning what we want is like the market to do some its, its, its work in, um, in the housing. Uh, and if there is a problem, then we can help you with cash. So basically the state, in a certain sense, public spending uh, uh, stayed the same, but the nature of the state radically changed. It became definitely more a state that, in a certain sense, uh, uh, let's say, doesn't act on the market, uh, but on, on the borders of the market or, or on the, on the, around the market by transferring some cash and by altering the rules, let's say the conditions of the game, rather than completely uh, changing the game, which was, I think, uh, the aim of the, um, the New Deal and the policies in the post-war period. I think if we, if we want to understand also the, 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 the rising relevance of basic income, it's, it's increasing appeal because, of course, uh, the idea has been around for a long time, uh, but it's only since the late 60s that uh, it has become, let's say, uh, a, a policy proposal that is actually considered by um, uh, politicians and um, policy makers. Um, and so the reason why it, it, it really becomes something on the agenda, while well, it was around way before, right, um, was in part, I mean, certainly because uh, we began to think about poverty um, in monetary terms. So uh, for a long time, this definition is like quite marginal. Uh, and then by the 70s, we really began to have our contemporary definition of poverty, which is like your position in the income distribution, right? Um, but of course, this, this definition has a certain limits. I mean, it doesn't give you, for example, a good sense of what does it mean to be poor in a country. If you are poor in a country where there is free health care and a country where there isn't free health care, uh, free health care, having a certain amount of money, it's a completely different thing. Uh, so your life would be radically different. Uh, so it doesn't really consider the institutions in which you are living, uh, and especially the relation between the state, the market, and um, the individuals in, in those societies. Um, so this, let's say, monetization of poverty completely put aside all those political questions about our relation to the market, and also individualized poverty. It seems as something that is um, an accident, that is you are in that um, place in the income distribution, but we don't really know why, we don't really know the causes, and all the policies became more about attacking only the effects 
of the market, meaning the market creates all those inequalities by altering the income distribution rather than actually attacking the market itself and transforming the, the causes of poverty. So we shifted, let's say, from a social policy that was about transforming the causes to a social policy that was also only about uh, mitigating the effects.